Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to listen to me yet some more. Um, I'm frankly amazed because we are winning. <laughs> um, so this morning I'm going to talk, and I really want to stress the improvised nature of this talk, uh, about uh, a topic which, which I have very strong opinions that are also quite strongly held. Um, and it's, a, it's on this topic of, of, of clicky maps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by telling you what a clicky map is, um, and then I'm going to talk about some Pythonic options. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using them as a data visualization technique primarily. Um, and then I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about a code package we started putting together to make it easier to use clicky maps. Um, when I submitted this talk, I made grand promises about this package being open sourced and made available. And that's still our plan. Um, not quite ready yet. So I'm afraid it is not in the public domain yet, but maybe this will give you a taste of what's coming. So just to start off with, you know, what, what is a clicky map? What do I mean when I when I use this term? And I'm being a little bit uh, um, facetious here. In that it's it's a cartographic map. So that's it's a representation of something. It's trying to represent uh, something in physical space primarily. Um, you know, obviously can't create maps that are identical to physical space because the definition of the physical space is the physical space that we're trying to represent. Uh, so we tend to do some sort of a projection system and we have to take account of pesky things like the curvature of the earth and you know, all sorts of trigonometry gets involved. Um, another feature of what we think of as the name suggests is that they interact with the things that you can actually click on and, and, and use. Um, so they are a type of visualization which is intended for um, users to be uh, engaged with and uh, interacting on a you know, basis. And the final one, which is, is that they are platformable. You know, that it's something that you can host somewhere where you can make it accessible to an audience that they can get to it. And that maybe sort of flows from the interactivity part, right? Um, so uh, generally speaking, these are web-based. These are things that um, can come, you know, that they're, they're, they're extensible to you. Um, you know, audience that is uh, there to get to this thing and actually use it, right? Um, so just to give you some examples, firstly, of what are, are not clicky maps, but, but just to try and give you some intuition about what they are. Um, oh, that's actually not good, but that's not actually a problem. So this is obviously a static map of the top half of the city of Cape Town, the suburbs of, of, of Cape Town. Um, and what you can see is that uh, I can't really click on this, it doesn't do anything. Um, it's not uh, a, yeah, and you know, it's, it's certainly a cartographic map. Um, and yeah, we sure we could host this file somewhere so people could get to it, but you know, it doesn't doesn't meet the threshold because it's not an interactive feature. Okay, this is another example of what I think is not a clicky map. So this is one of the API calls, it's something called the, the drill down tool, it's actually a way of interacting with service requests. And right at the top here, we have this very nice heat map over here. But I don't think this counts as a, a clicky map. Well, you can click on it, it is interactive, and you can zoom in on certain things. But um, the reason I think that it's not a, a, a clicky map is that you can't get a lot of detail, additional detail from it. Like, certainly when you zoom into areas, you can learn things. And when you apply some filters in the BI tool, the, the map is going to update. But in my view, it's not. Um, you know, it's certainly displaying information, but it's not a. Uh, okay, it's okay. Uh, should I try to? Ah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, apologies for that. I'm really not great with my. <laughs> um, so I certainly don't think that this is a clicky map because um, although it's sort of interactive, it doesn't have the, the level of interactivity that you would expect, and you certainly can't control a lot of what's on the map just by interacting with the map itself. It sort of exists in the context along with some other things. So I would call it like a, an additional visualization of what's going on in this tool. Okay. Um, so here's an example of what I think is a good clicky map. Um, this is actually, you rec might recognize this from the keynote yesterday. Um, so, um, this is a representation of certain metrics in the space. Um, 
And this is quite a common one. This is, you know, strictly speaking, people usually call these things chloroplex. Um, and there's quite a lot of information that can be derived, you know, by interacting with the map and, and finding things about it. Um, you know, we've, we've added some additional layers over here. We'll, we'll find out in a second. Um, and um, it's very easy to, to get, uh, you know, to, to intuit how to, to get some additional information. If you say interested in a particular area of the city and you zoom into that area of the city, and I'm, I'm zooming in on Kailicha right now, um, and you can mouse over and you can get uh, all sorts of information about what's happening in that particular area with respect to certain metrics that you care about. And these, these are certain metrics that we've been deriving relating to uh, service requests. Um, moving on to the next example, um, okay, and I really hope it's loaded. Uh, this is unfortunately an example I can't, uh, that, that we can't really share because it's um, a lot of the information isn't approved for outside sharing. But this map, uh, for example, it displays a whole lot of information. And the idea behind it is where the previous map was largely about showing various metric values over space, this one is primarily to enable people to do sort of uh, visual correlations. So it's showing all sorts of potentially related information. So for example, over here, I'm showing uh, population density, and um, I'm now going to maybe show something like, uh, and this is actually a use that some of my colleagues did put this map to. Um, the, this, these are various infrastructure projects that the city is doing. And you know, one thing that they were very interested in was to say, um, you know, do, are we doing infrastructure projects where there are people? Um, which, you know, is always a worrying question to hear people in <laughs> the local government planning asking, but better they ask the question than not. Um, so as you can see, you know, we have this, uh, you know, you present a whole lot of useful information alongside each other. They can turn various things on and off. Uh, another very important layer is this uh, vulnerability index. Um, which our, actually our colleagues at, at uh, provincial government shared with us. And for example, if you're interested in saying, okay, tell me about the places where people are particularly socioeconomically vulnerable, um, and then also I want to look at, say, for example, uh, where there is, the wrong button, um, where there's schools, right? So where are the schools that are in place in areas of particular socioeconomic vulnerability. So this is another sort of flavor of the, this idea of clicky maps. You know, it's, it's a cartographic map. It represents uh, space. Um, but then it's also, uh, it's interactive. Um, you can get quite a lot of information from it. Um, and also it's platformable. So this is actually living on a dashboard, but it, it's an HTML file that's being served up. There's all the GeoJSONs that contain all of this information in it. Um, so, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool, but it's obviously one that, that can be very easily abused. <laughs> um, so just to talk about some Pythonic options for building clicky maps, if that's your ambition. Um, so firstly, um, there's, and I actually found this nice example, oh, why is it loaded like that? Um, that there's various vendors who, um, People like Google Maps, Bing, Esri, you know, they all provide uh, tools and SDKs and ways of doing this. And this is actually a very nice option because it's a no-code um, thing. Uh, I think it's a Google Map um, that someone did for the unrest that we had last year in Kaoteng. Um, and they plotted various incidents of things that were happening in that area. Um, you know, and there, there's actually a whole uh, key that's associated somewhere. I was looking at it earlier. Um, but what's quite nice is that this is a way for people to very quickly and easily create um, these clicky maps, and it's also very shareable. It's very platformable because I think it's hosted by Google. Um, so uh, this is this is one route that you can go, and there are programmatic ways. There's a Python SDK for, for Google Maps. I just happen to use one for using their tooling. Yeah. Um, then there's Mapbox. Um, so Mapbox is a very popular. They're mostly, strictly speaking, like a a mapping data provider, but there's lots of tooling and probably the most common way 
that I've seen people use the Mapbox tooling is to use it with a plotting library called Plotly. Um, and I've got an example over here of this is this is the code that you would use to uh, plot all of the cities in the U.S. So someone is pulling some data that's the, the top U, the top cities in the U.S. Um, and then they are uh, selecting all of those cities or they're putting those all on a map. Um, and then they're using um, a tile provider. They're actually using OpenStreetMap tile providers, but um, it's coming from the Mapbox uh, API and it's going through their services. To use Mapbox, um, you know, full disclosure, quite a lot of the time, or to use a lot of their services, you need a API key. Uh, some of their services are you, you pay, some of it's free, but some of it you do have to pay for. Um, but it's a very popular option. I've seen lots of people use it. But to be honest, the one that we tended to use is something called Folium. And Folium is a library that wraps, um, it's essentially a collection of Ginger templates uh, that wrap something called, um, um, it's, it's, it's still, uh, it, it, it wraps the, uh, it wraps a Ginger template which wrap around the JavaScript library called Leaflet, which is probably the most popular uh, open source mapping library, web mapping library out there. And um, this uh, is just an example of what some of the code looks like. And it's actually you know, very easy to get started. Um, all that I've done over here is I've created a map object and then um, I've added a marker to that map object. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, oh, where's my marker um, it, it gives you something like this. Um, it gives you a map of Cape Town um, and you can see, um, you know, that it's uh, doing, uh, you know, that the, the very easily, just with like a single line of code, I created some code that's roughly centered on, on Cape Town, and it's used the OpenStreetMap tiles by default, so the background of the map, and it's very easy to layer stuff on top here. And actually, Folium is the library that we use internally the most um, to do various types of mapping, and all of the maps that you've been seeing me present so far except for things like in the drill down tool, um, those are all leaflets and folium based. So everything you've seen us do, it's possible to do inside uh, folium. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about this, probably the more, most opinionated bit of, of the talk, um, you know, what are they actually good for? Um, you know, what's the advantages of using, or when should you, you be using these, these clicky maps? Um, so I think that there's three really good reasons um, probably other ones, but the first one is that they are very familiar. People know what maps look like. They particularly know what maps is the place where they live look like. Just from looking at things like weather reports, just from, you know, navigating around a city, um, it's something that they know and it doesn't scare them outright, you know. They, they're going to look at it and a whole bunch of heuristics in their brains kick in, for good and ill. Um, the other thing about maps is that they can be actually very information dense, and particularly this is the clicky map. You know, because you can put a whole lot of information there, and because they're interactive and, you know, quite importantly have a zoom feature, um, you can put quite a lot of information, and provided all that information isn't sitting right on top of each other, um, you can convey quite a lot. And you can put quite a lot of information out there, and then people can interact with it, and this is the third point, um, they can get the detail that they require by zooming and selecting and clicking and hovering over. Um, and that, that sort of fulfills the principle of detail on demand. And that's a very good design principle if you want to avoid overloading an audience. By presenting them with something and saying, go to the part of this visualization that you care about. And with very intuitive ways, they can find out additional information about that place. Um, you know, that, that's a great thing. So just to illustrate some of these principles, and uh, um, because of the, <laughs> my, let me see if, what if I can zoom, change my zoom, no, okay, I'm afraid not. Okay, so what I've done in this uh, map over here was I had highlighted particularly Simonstown, which is unfortunately just below the cuttle, um, which is the suburb I grew up in in Cape Town. And whenever I see a map like this, that's the first thing I look at, because I, it's the place I'm most familiar with, uh, you know, in, in Cape Town. So, um, you know, that, that sort of illustrates that point of people are immediately going to look at it, they're going to think about something like, where is my house? They have a sort of pseudo-emotional connection to, to this visualization you're presenting them with. 
So it's quite a powerful thing. You know, people don't naturally relate to a table or a graph in the same way because it's not something they're as comfortable with. Um, just to illustrate that information density point, I'm gonna go back to this guy. Um, so for example, I'm gonna turn on a bunch more information here. And particularly if you do some clever stuff around, um, say for example, um, the, uh, you know, some of the different visualization techniques available. Um, just, uh, come on, okay, there we go. Um, you can see I'm actually showing a huge amount of information here. So what I've selected in this, this, this visualization, I've, I'm showing this vulnerability there, so the socioeconomic vulnerability of different people in, across Cape Town. I'm also showing the, the schools, shopping centers that are above a certain size, public transport interchanges, uh, informal trading locations, uh, as well as SASA offices, and actually I'm gonna just throw in the SASA pay points too. Uh, so those are shops that distribute social grants to people. Um, and you know, there's a huge amount of information. There's a couple of thousand uh, data points where you can see it's actually, uh, you know, several hundred as well as um, the, uh, you know, as well as all the vulnerability information. And what I'm able to do is, your audience is still not going, is not overwhelmed by uh, what they're seeing here because they're like, oh no, this is the map. I recognize the map of Cape Town. I'm going to focus in on the areas and say they had a particular interest in, I don't know, um, you know, the, the, towards Musenberg, Lakeside, that area. In fact, let me turn on the under the, the feature map so that I can see uh, which suburbs are underneath here. Um, and you know they can focus in here and they can get quite a lot of information about uh, the layout of retreat and its surrounding areas. Um, you know they can see things about where the locations of the schools are, where the shopping centres are. There's the Blue Roof Mall for those in Cape Town who know it. Um, you know there's all the, the, the various uh, SASA pay points, etc. And so you know there's a huge amount of information that's being conveyed here. And um, people are able to access it and use it. Um, you know, they're, they're able to find what they want without just being like completely overwhelmed and, and scared. Obviously, you have to be quite careful because if you load up the map and it looks like this to start with, people do get a bit frightened. So, generally speaking, our our practice is to load with only one or two layers ever loaded at once, but make it very clear and very obvious to people how they can add additional information to to the map. Um, I think that's the one. Oh, and then this is this, this idea of detail on demand. And it's a little bit of a cleaner example, I think, of showing how you can get to particular information very quickly um, just by looking at the, um, you know, you, you, you can, the, the, the color of the different dots indicates something about the service level in that particular area, and this information is a bit old. Um, but you can very quickly and very easily get down to the point and then each of these individual markers represents a particular service request. So we're representing, you know, hundreds if not thousands of service requests to the audience, but we're doing it in such a way that they aren't overwhelmed and where necessary, they can get all the way down. And the, the, the intention here was for them to be able to get to a place where there's a certain number, threshold of service requests that aren't being met within target, so they can go and investigate. And that's the key bit of information service request number right so um, you know what this um, you know what, what this this sort of tooling does it's you know it's an incredibly powerful thing um, you know that you can use these sticky maps for um, so now just to talk a little bit about in my opinion what they're not so good for and what are some of the caveats and pitfalls about the, these these maps um, the first one relates to to cognitive overload um, in that people are very uh, Go, if you do this incorrectly, um, it's very easy to overwhelm the audience. And I'm sure even when I was turning on all of those layers on the previous example, some of you were a bit like started glazing over and thinking, what the hell? Like, <laughs> this is representing so much information, you know, how do I make sense of it in any shape or form? Um, and that's something you have to be very careful over here. And it can be quite dangerous, especially when you're starting out and you're using them for the first time. You're like, oh, I can add this information and this other information. And you keep coming up with use cases and potential uses for it. And at a certain point, you have to stop and, and sort of scale it right back because you need, 
you lose the ability to see the map for the first time, and you need you need to make sure that people seeing it for the first time just don't get completely blown away. Um, another problem, and this is actually a really big one, is that uh, particularly when drawing Cora plates, um, people are very um, we, we have a cognitive bias towards responding to large shapes. We always assume that size relates to importance. Um, and that's a very big problem um, when working with clicky maps. Because if you're partitioning up your space, say you're dividing up your city, and I'll go up to an example. Um, let me go to an example in the, the vulnerability view. Oh, not this one. Um, I'll go go into an example over here. Um, you know, if, for example, I load up the suburb layer of the, the city, um, you can see that not all the suburbs are of an equal size. And for example, Philippi is officially one suburb, but it's an enormous area that covers a whole lot of farmland as well as places where people actually live. Um, and if you start coloring in this map associated with it, another good example is to the north of the city, we have uh, what we call the Cape Farms, sort of the area between the end of town up towards Atlantis. Um, those areas, if, you know, any metric that you're drawing and you're using to color in these spaces are going to appear as, um, they're gonna really stand out and people are gonna pay disproportionate attention to those, even if you don't think that they should. Um, and this is particularly dangerous because, you know, often the partitioning of spaces is inversely related to things like population density. And often you want people to pay attention to the really population dense areas. Um, and, and you can actually see that, I can actually illustrate this by putting on the population density layer, but you'll see that the population, where the population density is, is higher, there's more intricately nested suburbs. And so it's quite a dangerous uh, thing that you have to be thinking quite carefully about when interacting with, um, you know, when presenting this information to people. People can very quickly get misled. And there's actually a very simple remedy that, that we use quite a lot, which is that whenever you draw core plates, just use a uniform grid of some sort. Um, if I had a bit more time, um, you know, something I thought I would maybe have spoken a bit about is some of the techniques we use to resample the data to go from irregularly shaped shapes into those uniform grids. But maybe we can chat about it in the questions. Um, then the final concern, and I think this is a really important concern, is about accessibility. Uh, it's very difficult to turn maps into something where people who have trouble seeing um, or can't see, uh, can, can, it can be accessible to them. It's much easier to do that with things like bar graphs and tables, etc. So, you know, if, if your audience, you, you've got to think quite carefully about that. And, you know, as a rule, accessible design is good design. Um, it's something to weigh up and think about when presenting the information. Is the information that you're presenting as a map, could, could you be making it in another, available in an additional form so that it's accessible to everyone? Um, oh, oops, I don't know how that's, why, why that, 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 that's showing up over there. Um, okay, so now, just to close off um, and give us a bit of time for questions, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, this library that we're developing called Picky Map Utils, um, which as the, the name suggests is, is for, for creating uh, clicky maps. I really do want to caveat that it is a, a work in progress, um, but what it does is it tries to make the layer abstraction a little bit stronger. So Folium sort of has a notion of uh, base maps as well as uh, layers, so these are different core plates or outline shapes or markers or whatever. Those are layers of information that you're putting on top of your map. Um, we're trying to make that a little bit stronger in our library, um, and there's a particular focus on um, I.O., so making it much easier to express and capture information relating to fetching the data that goes into the map. Um, and this relates to our use case, because we're often creating maps that are pulling data that's been generated by a previous stage in our pipeline. Um, another one that's quite important there is uh, also that it's often desirable to have groups of folium layers together. And folium does, the library does actually provide a semantic for, for grouping stuff together. They, they call them feature groups and it actually relates to something uh, in the underlying leaflet API. Um, but we've, we've sort of 
our, our concept of a layer is, is, is really a group of foliar layers, uh, an opinionated grouping of foliar layers. Um, so just to give you an idea of sort of our main workhorse of this class is, is a data class. Um, we have a whole bunch of properties relating to the I.O. information of the layer. We have a whole bunch of information relating to the um, state variables of the data that's going to potentially inform the layer. Um, there's a bunch of information relating to the layer in relation, in relation to the, the map. Um, whole some additional properties relating to the display of it, the, the, the layers that make up our, our, our property class. And then finally, um, something else we we introduce as a notion of there being metadata associated with the layer. And there's, there's various options around displaying that metadata as part of the layer. Um, and just to give you a feel about, you know, why we're doing this, or, you know, this is a bit about that I.O. side of things. This is a function where um, we are, it's a transparent function, so you pass in one of our classes and you get out one of our classes. But what it will do is we'll use the I.O. variables that you specified to populate a whole bunch of the other state variables. So this is part of the generation process. You declaratively, uh, you know, you declare your, your layer and you specify a bunch of I.O. properties and then uh, our library goes off, fetches that, that, that info, uses that I.O. information to fetch the underlying data and then populates a whole lot of other information inside the class. Um, and you can see the logic internally, which I've just given you a little feel for, is, um, you know, if the information is local, just read the local stuff. If it's sitting inside Minio, which is, remember, the S3 equivalent API that we use internally, um, it goes and fetches it from Minio. If it is, uh, this is using another internal package, and this is part of the refactoring that I'm having to do, um, it goes off and tries to fetch the data from uh, using these other, these other ways of sourcing GIS information. So it makes it really easy to pull in data from all sorts of different sources, right? Um, now to, uh, just to show you a little bit about what the declarative structure of the tool is, and I apologize, but I couldn't really think of a good way to, to represent this, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, but this is what a script looks like when it's using that Clippy Maps utils. Um, to declare a layer looks something like this, and this is an example where I'm I'm using some data that, that exists locally, uh, setting some other properties and telling it, for example, that it's a point layer, um, and you know, here's a bunch of things relating to how that 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 cool that that layer should be displayed. And then just to give you an example of one that looks different, this is this is one of those core reflect layers, um, and it's fetching the data actually from somewhere else. This is the identifier that it's using to fetch from our GIS system. Um, and then finally, you know, this might look like a relatively, you know, it's a relatively verbose, relatively long script, but in, you know, the map building world, this is easily a third or 20% of what it would be otherwise. Uh, so a lot of heavy lifting, undifferentiated heavy lifting is being hidden inside our library. Um, another thing that our, our library does that's a little bit different from Folium is ten, Folium tends to produce a single flat HTML file, which does have its advantages and we can still do that but we tend to like producing a directory that has not only the map but also all of the relevant javascript and css dependencies as well as then all of the data files are separate geojsons and there's a couple of reasons we're doing that and we can maybe go into the questions about why we why we think it's a better idea to separate that stuff out um, and then you know just to show you what the output from that script looks like um, it produces maps that look like this. Um, another thing that our library is doing is we, I don't like the built-in Folium uh, legend generation, so we've got a, I think, a slightly better way of generating legends. Um, so yeah, you can see that this is, uh, you know, very easily and very quickly you can get to maps that perform all of these different criteria. Okay, um, so just in terms of what we're gonna do to this library before we release it, um, I still need to factor out some of the internal code. Uh, you know, it's, it would be very bad, very sad to release a library out there which will only ever work if you can connect to the City of Cape Town network. Um, obviously, we want to get it out there and make it ready to be worked on by other people. And then something else which I'm quite keen on doing is our open data portal um, actually 
is very strong on geospatial data. And it would, it's an obvious win to make this very interoperable with our open data portal because then this becomes a library that makes it very easy to work with the data on our open data portal in a programmatic way. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's uh, So just to conclude, um, I'm just going to go back to the beginning. Um, what did I tell you about? I told you a little bit about clicky maps, you know, what they are. I then talked a little bit about some of the Pythonic options for um, enabling and creating clicky maps. Talked a little bit about the pros and cons of them as a data visualization. And I just finished off by talking about our, um, our, our internal library, this clicky maps utils. Uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to fix a couple of issues with the slides and I will put them online. I realized one or two of the visualizations didn't work as well as they should have. Um, so yeah, please, um, but, yeah, uh, I would really be interested to hear a little bit about what else, what people, other people are doing with Clicky Maps. Um, if you've got any strong feelings about them, maybe disagree with some of my opinions, um, you know, please, please let us know. But otherwise, yeah, thanks for listening. Actually, a really good question. I've, I've made a couple of, I've done a couple of pull requests against Podium, uh, mostly quality of life stuff. Um, the one thing, though, that the maintainers have expressed to me in the past is they're quite, they're a bit weary of taking on overly opinionated wrappings of particular um, features of of Leaflet. Um, so. I suspect some of the stuff that I'm suggesting to them might be um, might cross that line, um, but yeah, I think it's worth thinking about, and it's worth. I mean, the other stuff around strengthening some of the I/O stuff, which we we're doing as an enhancement. Um, I think there might be some scope there, definitely, because um, Folium has some, you know, broadly speaking, basically you can either provide a local like a, a, a data frame to the library, or you can um, provide a URL to like a GeoJSON file. Um, you know, but there's no option, for example, to pass in any sort of auth information when it's accessing that, that, that URL. So it just has to be a URL that's generally accessible. Um, and, and I think that's a bit of a weakness. Um, and you know, certainly a lot of a lot of our I/O code is just wrangling various types of auth and things, right? So yeah. Yeah, I think that there's, there's, it's a good question and it's definitely always worth, because I think if, if we've run into these problems, then other people have run into these problems, right? And so it, it, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> So by bivariate, do you mean um, like split ones, or do you mean when you have multiple layers on top of each other? The second, oh, yeah. you're saving your voice, aren't you? Um, yeah, so um, that's um, the way that I think people actually interpret bivariate ones. And let me actually switch to one of, uh, to one of our ones. Again. So for example, an argument I was having with people related to this vulnerability layer, as well as um, the population density of the city, because I pointed out to them that, well, actually, if you look at the, the population density and you look at the vulnerability, they're actually very similar to each other. Um, and they sort of weren't getting that point as much, you know, I actually did the statistical correlation, and 
and that was the more convincing argument. But um, the way that I think people do inter do read and understand bivariate stuff is that if they have the ability to turn the layers on and off very quickly, um, and do exactly what I'm doing now, right, where I turn it on, I turn it off, and I sort of see. It's this, the other technique which we've used at times, which has has had very mixed results, is if you carefully choose your color palettes such that they combine in a way that, um, so for example, if you have like a red palette and a blue palette, when they're overlaid on top of each other, if they are, you know, the very purple areas tell you that both values are quite high. Um, you know, so there, there is something that you can start doing there where you start, you know, the, the, the comp they use the color mixing properties and then the combinations of different colors and the resulting thing that it get, you get out of that conveys information. But yeah, that actually gets back to that point about cognitive overload. Um, I think that it's very easy to put, um, particularly like multiple core reflects on a map and think like, oh, I'm conveying all this information to my audience. And actually you're not, you're just overwhelming them and they, they get bored and confused and they go away, you know? So that's, that's really, I think then also there's, um, there's often scope, and certainly with this map, um, I think we, you know, at times we, we try to be relatively smart about what we made core effects versus what did we like put little markers down. Um, and I don't know, sometimes we, I think we're, I'm not convinced we got it right, you know, that, like for example, it makes a lot of sense to me that um, the schools are particular points in space. Um, but for example, the public transport interchange, we did as these little polygon outlines because they're, they're often quite big spaces. Um, and yeah, I wonder if maybe we shouldn't have just made them markers um, because you know people tend to think of them as, as, as places, not, not as like, quite big spaces, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question. Well, actually, maybe if I can. <laughs> cause trouble and um, ask, um, so my colleague Suleiman has also been working quite a bit with, um, you did some stuff with Plotly, yeah, right, and then yeah. you, you used, you then switched over to using our internal tooling. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, to add maybe.